just wanted to thank you for your informative approach to dealing with Islam as well as sharing your experiences within the, within the context of your work with Islam. I've been approached this issue of Islam and the situation with Islam in the West today from a slightly different perspective, and that's through the window of theology. Now the question is, what is theology first? It, theology comes from two Greek words, theos and logos, meaning respectively God and wisdom, logic, or knowledge. So when we speak about theology, we're talking about the knowledge, understanding, and comprehension of the divine based upon key <laughs> assumptions. And now when I say assumption here, I'm, I, I use this word because all religion, whether it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, whatever, when reduced to its elemental mass is based upon assumption, and we know this better as faith. Faith is <clears throat> a simple trust, an assumed belief that is believed as is. And it's from that simple assumption that an entire worldview, a philosophy, and eventually a religion emerges. The simple assumptions that constitute faith are called dogma. Now, a dogma is a fixed truth or assumption that never changes and is absolute in its nature. Um, and it can often be expressed as a simple yes or no type question. Uh, for instance, the statements, there is a God, versus the statements, there is no God. Now, whether you believe in God or not, it it's, does not matter because there is no middle position in this. You either believe in God or you do not believe in God because God cannot exist and not exist at the same time. And I want to emphasize this. Both of these examples are examples of dogma because they are assumed or believed in faith. And this is the heart of theology. Theology deals with dogma, and it deals with the identification, understanding of these dogmas, their assumptions, and their implications for how they form our worldviews. And I'm explaining this to you because this is the problem that we are facing today between Islam and the West, as well as within the heart of Islam itself. We are not witnessing what some have called radicalism, Islamofascism, or extremism, but something that is far more dangerous. We are witnessing the public manifestation, fulfillment, and fruition of orthodox Islamic theology. It's more accurately called fundamentalism because the term fundamentalism was originally used in around 1912 to describe a series of evangelical American Protestant essays that attempted to outline the fundamentals, or the basics, of Protestant Christianity. And I, I say this because in the same way, uh, Muslims who commit acts of terrorism are not extremists, radicals, or political fascists, but their acts flow out of their obedience to orthodox Islamic teaching and dogma, that, and that is, as I mentioned earlier, which is grounded in the very dogmatic building blocks of the Islamic religion. Uh, for this reason, orthodox Islam cannot and will never be reformed because it is impossible to change that which, according to Islam, is unchanging, divinely revealed truth, dogma. And, and these dogmas are what give justification, inspiration, and encouragement to acts such as the killing of apostates, jihad, and the abuse of non-Muslims, particularly in our context, Christians and Jews. And these acts are inseparable from Islamic theological dogma, and to partially or to wholly renounce them means, from a theological perspective, to partially or wholly renounce Islam. And before I continue, I want to emphasize this point to you very carefully, and that is that this does not mean that all Muslims believe in, would engage in, or would even support the killing of apostates, abuse of non-Muslims, or jihad. However, once again, an individual person or people's opinions do not reflect Orthodox Islamic teaching. Uh, using the example from the Catholic faith, Orthodox Christian teaching has always and vehemently opposed abortion. However, there are many Catholics who support abortion. Those Catholics who in their own personal beliefs support abortion do not reflect Orthodox Catholic teaching. And in this regard, their personal beliefs are in opposition to the Catholic faith they claim to espouse. Uh, likewise, following this same example, there are Muslims who do not believe in, <coughs> would renounce or have renounced, and do or have opposed jihad, apostates killing, and abuse of non-Muslims. And I want to say that I encourage and I support such people. This is a very good thing that these people do not believe in these things. However, the problem is, from the perspective of Orthodox Islamic theology, their personal beliefs in this regard are in opposition to the faith which they claim to espouse. And technically, that is the theological definition of heresy, which is to oppose aspects of what one claims to believe. Therefore, it's easy to see why it's very difficult to find pious, learned Muslims who honestly and earnestly oppose these acts. And the reasons are several fold. First, it would cause them to fall into heresy. Second, 
they would be ostracized by their fellow Muslim communities until they repented of their heresy because they're heretics. Third, they would receive condemnation from fellow, imam, from fellow imams and muftis. A muftis are people who give fatwas or decrees on Islamic law. Fourth, they could be killed because if the Muslim community or a Muslim juror found that this person's heresy had led him to apostasy, which is the active opposition or abandonment of religion, in this case Islam, then they would warrant the penalty that is mandated by orthodox Islamic teaching for heretics, which is Whoever changes his religion to one other than Islam, kill him. For this reason, now, I want to turn to these three major issues I've been talking about, which is again, jihad, the killing of apostates, and the abuse of non-Muslims. And I want to show how theology brings all these issues together in one question that is a simple yes or no. And that is, is man's human dignity something that is intrinsic to his creation? You see, in Islamic theological dogma, it teaches that man is created with dignity, human dignity, but it is within the context of obedience to Islam. Uh, the exact position is reflected in the Hadith saying, Every child is born as a Muslim, but his parents make him a Jew, a Christian, or a pagan. And it's also reflected very clearly in the Quranic statement, we have created man in the best of molds. Then do we abase him to the lowest of the low, except for those who believe and do righteous deeds, for they shall have a reward unfailing. Now there are many other passages of the Quran and the Hadith that speak about the, what I'm about to say, but these are two primary examples of this. Where I'm going with this is, in Islam, the theological understanding is, dogmatically, if you are a human being, you are created with full human dignity by your creation and birth as a human. However, your dignity <coughs> exists within the confines of obedience to Islam. You are free to leave Islam. That is a choice of your free will. However, in so doing, with that, you abandon your human dignity. Thus, the, the rights and dig human dignity that endow you with your humanity are conditional upon your acceptance <coughs> of and obedience to Islam. This is theologically speaking. And we can contrast this with the words from the biblical book of Genesis, at chapter 1, verse 26 which states that man is created in the image and likeness of God. And I mention this because whether we believe, whether we are Christians or Jews, or we do not believe in any religion, our Western heritage is founded in many ways on Judeo-Christian thought as well as Greco-Roman thought. So to that extent, in Christianity and Judaism, they both teach that man's human dignity is something that is intrinsic to him. It's an inherent part of his creation that is inseparable from him and always remains with him. The differences that we can see between the Jewish Christian yes versus the Islamic no answer to the question, is man's human dignity something intrinsic to his creation, is profound. The Christian and Jewish position establishes that every person is inherently human by his creation and always remains as such. So all men have rights and are to be treated fairly, justly, and equally because each man reflects God in his individual, personal, created existence. On the contrary, Islam establishes that man is indeed created with human dignity, but because human dignity remains with man only when he is an obedient Muslim, it is required only that Muslims receive human rights, justice, dignity, and respect because they possess full humanity. Since non-Muslims willfully and consciously reject Islam and with that their human dignity, they do not possess full humanity and can, be, and can or have the potential to be treated in a subhuman manner. Now, I, I want to emphasize here again, it's not required by Islamic theology that non-Muslims or even Muslim apostates be treated in an undignified subhuman manner. And it is perfectly possible, in theory, that non-Muslims be treated in the same manner as a faithful Muslim. Once again, however, this is in theory. How, because of the fact that Islam, as a religion, refuses to recognize the dignity of non-Muslims, it opens up for the possibility and for the permissibility for mistreatment without any kind of barrier to prohibit this. So therefore, while Muslims are not required to do these things to non-Muslims, neither are they required to treat them with the respect and dignity due to a fellow Muslim. And that is a very important and fine distinction. I want to give an example of this 
there was a problem, I think it was in the year 2008, when this exact theological issue came to an international scene. When there was a sheikh from Australia who said, regarding women who do not wear the hijab, a Muslim or not, they are, quote, uncovered meat who are asking to be raped. Now, the reason why I said this is because non-Muslims, as well as disobedient, and by that I mean heretical or apostate Muslims, have rejected Islam, and with that, as I've said, their human dignity, as taught by Islamic theology. In this case, the Sheikh was saying, in honest and faithful concordance with Orthodox Islamic theology, that if, a, if such a woman is raped, she is the one who has at fault, because by her choice to reject Islam, and subsequently, her own human dignity, she has abandoned the protections that a human being possesses, and therefore, if something happens, it is not happening to a person. The real danger of this example, as I've emphasized, is not, is not rape, but it's the fact that as illustrated through this, Islamic theology treats human dignity as though it were a license. It can be taken away if the conditions, in the case of Islam, uh, not being Muslim, are not followed. And for this reason, it's oftentimes why people draw the parallel between Islam and fascism, uh, Nazism, or totalitarianism. Because within these political systems, men are given the right to deem other men's lives as worthy or unworthy of existence. But there is a difference. These are political systems. And there is nothing political about, about Islam, because while Islam has a political system within it, these political systems, uh, fascism, Nazism, totalitarianism, communism, etc., they are not believed to be divinely revealed. And they do not have positions that are, un that are unchanging. Islam, on the other hand, is based out of, as I mentioned, what is believed to be eternal, revealed truth, dogmatic truth. And these cannot change, theologically speaking. Uh, following this example, I'd like to say that before a Muslim can wage jihad, uh, mistreat a non-Muslim, or kill an apostate, uh, the non-Muslim must be given the chance or sh at least should be given the chance to convert to Islam. And the reason is simple. It's because, as I mentioned, human dignity is connected to being a Muslim and obedience to Islam. Therefore, the person should be given a chance to regain his humanity by reversion or reacceptance of Islam. The, I say this word reversion because you'll hear Muslims, especially Muslim missionaries, use this term frequently. Because remember, if you are all created as Muslims, then by your leaving Islam, by being a Christian, a Jew, a pagan, atheist, fill in the blank, then by your believing in that, you have cast off your dignity. So when you revert to Islam, you are re-accepting that which you rejected, that or that which was taken away from you if you were raised as a Christian or a Jew or whatever. So, so the idea of reversion is very common in Islam, and you will hear this term mentioned a lot. This is why I use this word. However, if the person refuses to become a Muslim, he can be treated as one wills because he is no longer a human being and he has rejected a chance to regain his dignity. Under Islamic law, this would be classified as what is called maqbuli. And this is a reflection of Muhammad, which means acceptable. And this is a reflection of Muhammad's statement, la durar wa la darur, neither harmful nor helpful. Meaning an action is not mandatory, but there is no sin involved if one chooses to do it. It's not mandatory to engage in jihad. It's not mandatory to kill apostates. It is not mandatory to mistreat non-Muslims. However, the potential exists to do it. There are no barriers for any potential moral quandaries, and it is not a sin if one chooses to do it. Remember, it's neither harmful nor helpful. Because it is considered under Islamic law acceptable, maqbul. And an excellent example you can see in our own times today of this is if you ever watch the terrorist videos, such as those that uh, Mr. Bin Laden puts out, or that other terrorists, such as uh, Mr. Uh, Adam Gadan has put out, if you ever carefully watch them, you will notice that they almost always extend an offer for you, the viewer, to accept or revert to Islam. And the reason why they do this is several fold. First, they're making you, the viewer, aware that according to Islam, you have done something that has put you in opposition in theological opposition. Second, they are warning you of the consequences for people who oppose Islam and refuse to become Muslims, obstinately refuse. Finally, they're allowing you a chance to regain your humanity by reversion, that word again, to Islam. <coughs> theologically speaking, a person who converts to Islam is inviolable. They're haram. They have become sacred. 
because that person has full human dignity and must be treated as any other Muslim. Even if you were in a battlefield, um, in, a, in a war situation, Muhammad uses this example many times throughout the Hadith. If a person is in physical battle with, with another Muslim, and, that, and there's, he's a non-Muslim, and he says, I convert to Islam, I cease. That person becomes inviolable. No matter what he has done before, all of his errors, all of his errors, all of the whatever, whatever fighting he engaged in, he must be treated as a fellow Muslim because he has now accepted his full human dignity. And in Islam, it is a sin to kill another Muslim. It is a grave sin. It's a sin that lands a person directly into hell, theologically speaking. So therefore, if you refuse to convert, and then if a person decides to do something, Theologically speaking, it's not his fault what happens to you, but it's your fault. And the reason why is just using, as I mentioned in the rape example, you refuse the chance to reaccept your human dignity by, con by conversion to Islam. What happens to you after that is your problem. And as I, this can also be reflected in, in early Islamic history through Muhammad's treatment of non-Muslims, particularly the Jewish people. And remember, as because practicing Jews, as well as Christians, are not Muslims, they have willfully rejected Islam and are subhuman. And during Muhammad's lifetime, this and his other anti-Jewish attitudes began after the tribes of Arabia, the Qaynuqa, the Quraiva, and the Nadir, refused to convert to Islam. And Muhammad used, used their opposition to his military raids against their tribes on this basis to wage jihad against them and eventually exterminate them from most of the Arabian Peninsula. And I, I forgot to mention here, I have a binder here of several quotes. Oh, I didn't realize that. I have a binder here of several quotes of Muhammad's sayings concerning Jewish people as well as Christians. I <coughs> encourage all of you to look through this. I also encourage all of you to look through some of the classical sources of Islamic theology that I brought. I brought what's called Sahih Bukhari, which is a very well-known, highly respected work of what's called hadith, or Islamic tradition. And it's from this that we can derive much of our theological understanding. It helps us to interpret the Quran, which is the holy book of Islam. But continuing on, for centuries, uh, Jewish and Christian peoples have lived in Islamic societies, and with their conduct has been governed by a lack of recognition of true humanity, and as a result, citizenship in society. Now, it is very true and well documented that there are many times in history that Jew, Christ, Jews and Christians lived in peace and great harmony with Muslims and in Muslim governments. However, despite this, it has never changed the fact that aside from the situation, their political and social situation, depending upon the ruler in power, it has not endowed them with the same human dignity because according to Orthodox Islamic the teaching, they still lack that unless they convert to Islam. As a result, <coughs> there is no political, educational, economic, or law enforcement solution that can resolve the situation with Islam and terrorism because the issues are theological in nature. They stem from the most foundational building blocks of Islamic dogma that constitute the core of Islam itself. The theology is a manifestation of these dogma. And to change the dogma would mean to change the theology. And that would be to, as Wafa Sultan has pointed out, to create an entirely new religion, you'd call it by the name of Islam. Islam cannot be theologically reformed. It's an oxymoron to say it can be changed without altering the core theology. However, as with all religions, Islam's influence, especially in the West, depends upon two components. First, it extends as far as people are willing to believe, accept, and implement its teachings on faith. Second, it necessitates a critical mass of people who are willing to follow and believe in Islam. And likewise, we can look at these two issues as representing two aspects in developing a long-term answer to the situation of Islam. Uh, first, the issue of belief. Islam must be addressed through an aggressive campaign that targets core issues of Islamic theology. People, Muslim or not, must be continually exposed to theological questioning about Islam, and with that, people must be shown <coughs> alternatives to Islam. And this is part of a gradual process of intellectual inquiry and change. Conversion. It must be forward-looking in that instead of positing this as a defense of the West against Islam, as I've heard many people say, the West must be presented as a solution to the problems which stem out from Islam. In other words, we cannot any longer adapt a defensive posture in this situation. 
We must take a proactive, assertive view that begins by asserting our common Western heritage, which includes both our religious Judeo-Christian and our cultural Greco-Roman aspects, and then addressing Islam from this point. We must identify first and present a viable, consistent solution if we are to address Islam successfully. Because remember, Islam presents itself as a complete way of life, as one that answers religious questions, one that answers social questions, one that answers economic questions. So likewise, if we are to address Islam, we must be able to meet the questions that will be posed to us. And we must be able to do it in a succinct, clear, consistent manner. The second issue pertains more to non-Muslims. And this is the issue of followers. Now, we, now, the non-Muslims in the West must be encouraged to have strong, bountiful families. I know Larry mentioned earlier the issues regarding immigration. One of the biggest problems that few people are going to talk about with immigration is it started not just after World War II because of people who died, but because of two primary issues, families not having children and abortion. Those are the two hard issues that few people are willing to talk about. As a result, we, we in the West must maintain our families by encouraging non-Muslims, particularly Christians and Jews, to engage in behaviors such as marriage and bountiful families while discourage behaviors that are culturally and civilizationally suicidal, such as, as I mentioned, di divorce, abortion, and concubinage. To this extent, I want to add that the long-term struggle with Islam will not be won by great wars, battles, legislation, or politics. It will be won little by little through individual people living average lives that will result in a gradual transformation of society. And we may not see results for 5, 10, or 20 years. But if implemented, the results will inevitably come, and they will last for centuries, because as attempt, Islam is attempting to do now, they will form the foundation for our society's future identity, both culturally and in terms of physical human people. As one highly respected imam I heard say, when he was asked about the Islamization of American society, he said, quote, we must stop thinking about conquering the USA in two or three generations. These are his words. We must be thinking about how we want this country to look in 20 or 30 generations from now and shape our future from here. So to this extent, I'm going to say there is much hope. But we cannot place our hopes of, in, in dreams in trying to reform unreformable Islamic theology in legislation or in anti-terrorism efforts, although these are all very important aspects. Islam will cease its influence when people cease believing in it, and they propagate this through influencing those around them and passing it through their families. And I want to thank you all for listening to me.